I'm Mark Edwards. Welcome to Travelog and welcome to Tongren in northeastern Guizhou. We're here for their famed annual Dragon Boat Festival and we're hopefully going to discover what this mysterious province has to offer. Here we are at the launch event of the annual International Dragon Boat Festival and 30,000 people have packed into this arena to watch live music and performances highlighting Tongren's many ethnic minorities. Tongren lies on the northeastern border of Guizhou, one of China's less developed provinces. In recent years, monumental efforts have been made through blockbuster developments to turn it into a transport hub in China's southwest, complete with new expressways and airports. This makes sense when you take in the fact that the province is bordered by Chongqing municipality to the north and Hunan province to the east. Tongren itself is a vital nexus between central China and the southwest frontier and accordingly is known as the gateway to Guizhou. The many performances today have given us an insight into Noor culture, highlighted in the slightly more daring pieces. Noor is a time-honoured cultural phenomenon of rituals practised to expel evil spirits and disease. The name is derived from one such ritual, where people shouted Noor, Noor, to drive away the devil. It's a complex mix of anthropology, ethnicity, folk customs, religious ceremonies and drama. Of particular interest is the fact that historically some Noor devotees were known to be adept at, amongst other things, acrobatics and the rather more unusual skills of swallowing glass, eating porcelain, swimming in boiling water and walking on blades. days the performances are simply for show, but they highlight the importance that Noor culture still enjoys today in these parts of China. <laughs> Having become well and truly intrigued by Noor culture, I've made some inquiries and found that I can find out more if I head up to Dongshan Mountain. Lying on the east side of the old part of Tongren, Dongshan used to lie within the old city walls. Since the Zhou dynasty around a thousand years BC, most towns of a significant size in China possessed a city wall. Like various other innovations in Chinese history, the invention of the city wall is attributed to a semi-mythological sage. In this case, a Xia dynasty leader called Gun. It is said that Gun built an inner wall to defend the king and an outer wall within which the people could settle. It was a principle in building cities that they should be sited so that they were not constrained by geography. Feng Shui masters would be called in to make sure that the walled city itself as well as its gates and towers were in just the right place. Here in Tongren, dozens of temples dating back to the Ming and Qing dynasties, some of them 600 years old, stand on Dongshan Mountain.
So I've uh, hiked up to the top of Dong Shan, which is the East Mountain, and there's a temple up here which moonlights as a museum. One of the only museums in China to be dedicated to the worship of the Nuo culture, which is a form of animism or the worship of spirits. Now, as you can see, it's raining pretty heavily, so it looks like for the next hour or so, I'm going to have a few scary masks and some spirits for company. In many ways, the rain pounding outside simply serves to reinforce the atmosphere on the inside. Much of Noor culture is dedicated to drama, and the masks are supposed to make the performances more powerful. Noor opera, or Noor drama as it's alternatively known, is called the living fossil of opera. It's one of the most popular forms of folk opera in southwestern China. It has a long history with roots that can be traced back all the way to 1600 BC. Apart from the ferocious masks, it has a number of other special features, such as the unique dresses and adornments, the strange language used in performances, and the mysterious scenes. The opera integrates religious and dramatic culture. Essentially, the purpose of Noor opera is to drive away devils, disease and evil influences and petition the gods for blessings. I think that's probably enough scary masks for one day. But if you have any interest in the etymology of Chinese characters, you might want to linger in the Noor Museum for a little bit longer. On the pillars, you will see inscribed certain characters. They're in fact written, or created might be a more appropriate word, by the ancient Noor ancestors. The twist is that in fact, even a Chinese person will not recognize the majority of them. And don't bother turning to your Chinese dictionary, as that will prove to be a waste of time as well. Only dedicated scholars of Noor culture will be able to enlighten you as to the meaning. <laughs> don't let the weather get you down. You don't want to miss the only remaining active temple on Dongshan Mountain. Run by a faithful group of Buddhist devotees and scholars, who live here permanently. The temple is primarily dedicated to Guan Yin, the goddess of mercy and compassion. She is immensely popular among Chinese Buddhists, who see her as a source of unconditional love. The temple was built in the Tang Dynasty over a thousand years ago, but has been destroyed and rebuilt many, many times over the years, with its most recent renovation in 2002. The bricks and mortar might not be the same, but the culture has survived the test of time. In an age of unrelenting advances in technology, it's a breath of fresh air to make it to the summit of the Dongshan Mountain and witness these people going quietly about their daily lives, devoting themselves to prayer and quiet introspection. Having torn ourselves away from the cute puppies, we head back down the mountain. We spare a moment on the way out to take in the old city and its Catholic church. This part of town, known as Zhongnanmen, literally meaning middle south gate of the old city, used to be the commercial, economic and cultural centre of Tongren. The weather might have taken a bit of the shine off, but you can still appreciate the impressive architecture, which has been around here for hundreds of years. Considering the frequency of the short, sharp downpours in Tongren, 
It can be raining cats and dogs for half an hour before the sun comes crashing through for the same amount of time and then the process is repeated. It's a good thing that there's a very good irrigation system in place here. So you won't necessarily need to be wearing your wellies for your whole stay. With a relatively small population of around 100,000 people in the city itself and just over 300,000 people in Tongren County, it is nevertheless the largest population centre in Guizhou's northeast. Right, it's time to get out of the city and onto one of the top tourist spots in the whole of Tongren. So we're heading up towards the Nine Dragon Caves, so called because there were six yellow dragons. Chinese legend says they invited another three black dragons onto this hill and they all decided to meet in a cave and loved it so much that they decided to live there. Hence its name, Nine Dragon Cave. This is the mode of transport to get up there, so I'm going to get on the horse. Three. Three. <laughs> So as you can see, the Nine Dragon Cave, or Zhou Lundong, as it's known in Chinese, is slightly, well, totally off the beaten track. However, in many ways, this simply adds to the charm of the place and the sense of achievement when you finally make it up there. You'll first need to take a bus, and you should go roughly 15 kilometers east and get off a couple of kilometers past the town of Mayan. From there, you can cross the Jin River by ferry and hop on a horse for a couple of kilometers till you get to the top. To keep you company on the way, there are verdant forests, upright hills and crystal clear creeks. 